this year's winner of the prestigious Robert G. Dicus Award is Dr. Angela Wilson Panisi. <laughs> Angela, where do we even begin in telling the, your professional and personal journey? Your service to our section is extensive and impressive. Angela began her service on the Impact Editorial Board and continued as Managing Editor of Impact from 2011 to 2014. She then went on to serve as PPS Treasurer and Vice President. And yeah, during her Vice Presidency, there was that thing that happened. And Angela, thank you for your leadership during that time of crisis. Angela's service goes beyond her work at APTA Private Practice. She has also been the president of the Illinois Network of Independent Physical Therapists, as well as an engaged and affected, effective advocate for our profession. Here's what Dr. Teresa Marco had to say about Angela. She truly feels a responsibility to show up, to make that impact that we can all make just by showing up again and again and slowly changing the laws that affect our profession and our patients. And Angela, show up you have. Angela's strong relationship with legislators at the state and federal level have been instrumental in advancing key legislative priorities. Angela currently serves on the Finance Committee of APTA and is our representative to the International Private Practice Physiotherapy Association. Back home, Angela is also very passionate about advocating for small business and women in minor minority-owned businesses. And in her spare time, Angela owns a 22-year-old physical therapy practice, Physio Partners. Her company has been recognized as a multi-year winner in the Best of Chicago Award and Five Star Service Award. Colleague Rick Rausch notes, her locations are in very competitive markets. She has grown and prospered by bringing innovative ideas to her business model. Dr. Joseph Asher, business partner in Physio uh, Partners New Clinic in Glenville, Illinois, notes, that Angela's commitment is laser focused to improve PT owned practices and to reshape the whole of our profession. Even when the odds seem insurmountable, she maintains her vision for what private practice in our profession can be. And lastly, a little known fact about Angela she was born in the same small hospital as our last Dicus Award winner. A few years apart, of course. So if your travels ever take you on Highway 30 in Northwest Iowa, you might want to pop into Denison, Iowa and fill up your hydro flask because there's something special in the water there. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in congratulating and welcome your 2022 Dicus Award winner, Dr. Angela Wilson Panisi. Wow. Being nominated for, let alone receiving this award, is a humbling invitation to pause and reflect. To my friends and colleagues here, don't you know that every success I've had started from so many of you? The ideas and resources generously shared over the years, the open ears as we've shared our thoughts and concerns, have resulted in treasured connections. Thank you for your friendship and walking this path with me. The debt that we owe Robert Dykus, Charles Magistro, and Jim McKillop in founding this section, could they have imagined the abundance of gifts this community would develop almost 70 years ago? To the board, the awards committee, and my nominators, heartfelt thank you, and especially to Teresa Marco for bringing my name forward. Reviewing the letters of support written on my behalf brought me much joy. There are few gifts greater than to be recognized by the people you respect and admire so much. But I will share 
that I noticed the word most repeated in describing my leadership style was calm. So I've asked them to bring around some warm milk. We'll let you settle in with your blankies and I'll share a little bedtime story. Many of you may know that I grew up in Nebraska. Talking about yourself and your accomplishments is anathema to this upbringing. As well as, by the way, any use of a word like anathema, when certainly another word would do just fine. But as I spoke with the other recipients of this award, several suggested I share my story with the hope others might find it helpful in some way. I'm so blessed to have an abundance of parents here tonight, mom and Dan, dad, who all influenced me in their own ways. I love you, and thank you for making the trip for this special night. You know, when my own children were growing up, we heard a lot about helicopter parents, now progressing to lawnmower parents, mowing down all obstacles in the paths of their children. I think my parents would be happy to tell you, proud to tell you, that they were neither helicopters nor lawnmowers. But what I did learn from my parents is not to wait for things to be perfect, to make the most of what you've been given, and that you have the ability to bloom where you are planted. We moved a good bit when I was young, and I attended four different grade schools growing up. And during this time, I could frequently be found with my nose in a book, which allowed me to explore a wider world and help facilitate my success academically. Even today, one of my greatest self-care strategies is losing myself in a book just for a few minutes at a time. As I entered high school, I was lucky enough to reunite with a group of smart girls that I knew from one of those elementary schools. These women not only normalized my nerdiness, but their wicked sharp senses of humor also helped ensure I had a personality. I was learning to bloom where I was planted. As first in my family to attend college, I selected the University of Nebraska because it was economical. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do yet, and they had many choices of majors. Well, I think I got my money's worth and I changed majors at least three times. But after taking a year off between my freshman and sophomore year in which I worked and traveled as a nanny to a family in San Francisco, I was prepared to focus on pursuing a future as a physical therapist. By managing to graduate in three and a half years while working my way through school, my efforts were adequate to gain me admission to Columbia University's PT program. Now, Columbia is not known as an economical education choice. But by promising two years to the New York City Board of Education, after I graduated, the Ivy League was in reach. I was placed at PS 156 in the South Bronx for my first year out of PT school. And what can I say about PS 156's mentorship program? Well, I learned how to keep my wits about me on the walk from the train each day, and I learned to rely on myself, my education, and natural inquisitiveness to navigate a multicultural, bureaucratic, and hierarchical workplace that today's new professionals would not hesitate to label toxic. While I knew I would pursue a career in orthopedics after completing my commitment to the school system, I had no intention of wasting those two years. I spent my lunch breaks and the time I would have spent around the water cooler with my non-existent coworkers, drawing full anatomy diagrams on the chalkboards to keep my knowledge fresh and share with my young patients. I didn't know much about treating children, but I knew outcome measures were important. And I administered the school function assessment for every one of my students so I could prioritize which skills to work on with them. I identified members of the staff with whom I could align and advocate for PT services for my students in a system in which I had no status or influence. And three days a week, I would end the school day and complete an afternoon evening shift at an orthopedic, sports, and performing arts clinic on the Upper West Side of Manhattan so I could build my skills for the future. PS 156 is where I met Rosalind, a smart, charming third grader with diplegic cerebral palsy who was cared for by her grandmother. 
I was a very idealistic young therapist, and I believed in Rosalind's ability to bloom. Even at PS 156, with a therapist as underwhelming as I was, and I did my best to make that happen. The movie Titanic was a phenomenon during this time, and in an effort to make therapy more fun, and since I didn't really know what I was doing anyway, I taught her and some of my other students a choreographed routine to My Heart Will Go On by Celine Dion, focusing on their motor control, flexibility, and balance. Do you remember how the song goes? Do you want me to sing a few bars to help jog your memory? <laughs> I will spare you. <laughs> my husband's very happy to hear that. As my time with PS156 ended, my husband Chad and I, not waiting for things to be perfect, to move on with the business of life, started our family and moved to Chicago, where I was able to obtain a position in a suburban hospital outpatient ortho department in the non-existent job market following passage of the Balanced Budget Act of 1995. And I just remember being so disappointed that a single piece of legislation could affect my career and livelihood to such a profound level. And a future advocate was born. I also remember some disappointment after finally starting what I was expecting to be my dream job. I mean, I had 10 more minutes with my patients than I had in the ortho job in New York City in a spacious, beautiful facility with plenty of equipment. I would leave my newborn son, Calvin, and treat 19 patients before returning home every day. Each one, by the way, asking me who was taking care of my baby. Having somehow managed to pick up some clinical skills in that part-time job from the therapists whose patients were the dancers of the New York City Ballet, the Joffrey, the Juilliard School, no one ever canceled. And while I hadn't expected to bloom at PS 156, what I learned about movement and development as a pediatric therapist has informed my understanding of dysfunctional movement in orthopedic and chronic pain patients ever since. There was this one therapist I spoke with a lot during this time whom I'd gotten to know when I lived in New York City who had a private practice, and she encouraged me to join the private practice section. The rest is history. PPS member Carol Stillman is still one of my closest friends and greatest cheerleaders. Ask her some time to tell you the story of how we met. So, though my little family lived in a one-bedroom apartment with a little naivete and a lot of bluster, while remembering not to wait for things to be perfect before taking the next step, I opened a private practice in Chicago, where I did not know a single physician, and we did not have real direct access. In the middle of practically the birthplace of large-scale, multi-site practices. And yet, I figured out how to bloom. It took four years before I could support myself in that practice, and before I had a single staff member. I also practiced part-time in nearly every possible environment, in every neighborhood, and with nearly every patient population in Chicago. And because it had all been working out so well so far, we were finally able to upgrade to a two-bedroom apartment. We went ahead and completed our family with Walker. And I'm so blessed to have Calvin and Walker here with me tonight. I know I was a different kind of mom. I'd always hoped different in a good way. But the truth is, as a parent, you don't have any idea if you're doing it right until many years later. But I'm so proud of the men Calvin and Walker have become. I love you so much and I can't wait to see the ways in which you continue to bloom. I hope that a parent who needs it tonight has the opportunity to meet you. And feel just a moment of reassurance that the hard work of juggling a practice and parenting can also yield some really spectacular human beings. Twenty-two years 
and three locations later, surrounded by an amazing team of people. Sometimes I'm not sure how I've done this. I didn't set out to be named a leader or ever think I would follow in the footsteps of the founders of the section or other esteemed recipients of this award. There was no master plan for this garden. I have as many faults as anyone. I can be impatient. I'm easily disappointed. Sometimes I curse like a sailor. I've had patience, I've failed. But I've always contributed simply because I could, and it didn't seem right to not make the effort for a better practice, a better profession, a better community, and a better world. I think that many of us are guilty of underestimating the impact of what we have to offer, or we perceive service as a sacrifice. For me, service has instead provided the nourishment to sustain me, and never has this been the case more than during the first months of the pandemic. I know you are all beneficiaries of the work of the COVID Advisory Committee, a group of volunteers who pulled together, laser-focused our efforts on just a few key objectives and achieved all of them. With APTA, we achieved payment for telehealth services through the public health emergency that many of us were providing in our communities for reduced or free cost, just to make sure our patients received critical care. We influenced the guidelines for safely reopening practices while helping ensure that our small businesses could still realistically operate. We helped our members with the knowledge they needed to apply for business saving grants and loans. And we supported each other. Do not deprive yourself of this gift of serving others. Consider the ways in which service is not depleting, but instead replenishing. What if we operated at the level of the COVID Advisory Committee on just one initiative a year? What if 100 people contributed at one-tenth of that level, instead of just 25 people meeting day and night during one of the most challenging periods of their personal and professional lives? Where would we be as a profession? Where would the health of our communities be? In my experience, the barriers the world presents us with are nothing compared to the barriers erected in our own minds. Sometimes an obstacle viewed from another perspective is quite honestly an opportunity that another with greater advantages than you may not be prepared to identify at all. Every obstacle we overcome prepares us for the next success. Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius's words, that the impediment to action advances action. What stands in the way becomes the way. This has been demonstrated many times through history, from Rockefeller to Eisenhower to the work we do every day. Yes, the last few years have been hard on us. It's been painful to see our staff members struggle to find their paths, while too many times, which too many times this year has meant leaving us, their colleagues, and patients behind. My hope is that they carry forward and bloom in the profession with a seed planted during their time with us. But as we emerge and recover, where might the capacity that we've gained from overcoming these obstacles take us in our practices and as a profession? For example, we are frequently frustrated that we aren't recognized and compensated as primary musculoskeletal care providers. In our practice, we have decided not to wait to be invited to fill this role. We've simply started doing it, demonstrating the value to our patients and physician colleagues, changing how they interact with us, and finding a way to bloom. We take those blood pressures, we assess physical activity status as a vital sign, screen for health risk factors that can be modified through physical activity, and then help the patients overcome the barriers to addressing them. We assess for height loss and screen for osteoporotic fracture in female patients over age 50. And then not only do we report this data, but we provide context, including ranges and norms, just like a physician sees on a lab report. We set goals grounded in principles for behavioral change and educate patients about what they can do to change their own health destinies. 
These things may not all happen on the first visit. But as physical therapists, we are blessed with an entire episode of care to influence our patients. Taking two minutes out of just a few of those visits could significantly advance how we're perceived by our patients, the public, and our colleagues. Don't wait for things to be perfect. Don't wait for someone to invite you. Demonstrate your worth and bloom. Planting and nurturing these seeds in our practices and the profession is not easy, but the abundance and beauty of the garden will ultimately reflect our efforts. We all have our dry spells. Words of encouragement have frequently been the light and the water, allowing me to bloom through challenge. And too many times to count over the years, my husband Chad provided those words, believing in me on dark days when I didn't believe in myself or I wanted to quit. Thank you. I love you. The person you choose to spend your life with is one of the most important decisions that you'll make. And whether I was wise beyond my years when I married Chad Panisi 27 years ago, or just lucky, it's made all the difference. Rarely do we have the opportunity to understand the power in our words of encouragement. Remember Rosalind, interpretive dancer to the theme to Titanic? Well, we loosely stayed in touch and eventually reconnected on LinkedIn more than 15 years later. And she was in my thoughts on July 28, 2016, when the first female accepted the major party's nomination for President of the United States. And I sent her a quick message, just saying how seeing barriers overcome reminded me that when she was my student, that I was convinced that because of her abilities and talents, that she could be our first modern day president with a physical limitation. She thanked me. I didn't give it another thought. Until five years later, when she wrote me that she wanted me to know that the words I had shared with her had stayed with her and inspired her to persist and pursue her dream of becoming a published poet. You see, Rosalind is blooming. She graduated from college. She works as a family advocate to reunify broken families and shares her writing as a spoken word artist. Your true and earnest words of encouragement are never wasted and may make all the difference in someone's ability to bloom. Share them generously. Thank those who've encouraged you, as you may not always have another opportunity. Seek to understand others before seeking to be understood yourself, and you'll build the relationships that will sustain you. Our dreams for ourselves and our profession can be overwhelming when we try to figure out the next step. I've always worked to focus on that which is in my control, which is usually more than I think. Execute flawlessly on the fundamentals and be just one degree better every day. I mean, at a rate of improvement of 1% at a time, even the latest bloomer will eventually reach 100%. Executing flawlessly on fundamentals is not exciting. You won't be interviewed in a magazine or on television. Working hard never guarantees our ability to overcome adversity. And yet, by failing to apply ourselves fully, our failure is guaranteed. When I feel frustrated, I take Rosalind's words of encouragement from her book of poetry, Lady Lotus, that I'll share with her permission. I close my eyes. Start the rewiring. Start counting my blessings. I remember to start small out of an awareness to sometimes have a longer list. I begin to name my four leaf clovers with unclenched fists. You know, I'd like to apologize for my lack of transparency. I promised a calming story. Instead, I've given you a call to action. After the generosity of receiving this recognition, I've had the nerve to ask for more. But the stakes are too high for us to give up on our potential as physical therapists. The population desperately needs us to deliver. We must take charge of our destiny and bloom where we are planted today. We must generously provide light and water by encouraging one another 
Let's not wait for things to be perfect, to fulfill the destiny that Robert Dykus imagined for us, and let's cultivate an abundant garden. Thank you. Great job, Angela. Thank you so much for leaving this ground so fertile with all your service. Thank you.